Hello? Oh, Tom? Jack? Jack, is... It, what is there, a red alert on or something? Am I calling too late? No, 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 no. It says that the hours are later here. Are you okay? Is everything all right? Not really. Hey, Tom, I need some help. When you think a speechwriter's gonna fix it, you think that's the only problem? If I did, would I be calling you? <laughs> Look, I'm sorry I missed your presidential campaign. I just thought it was nuts. It looks like the voters agreed with you. Maybe it was crazy. Anyway, now I'm supposed to be running again for re-election to the Senate, you know, and people aren't giving anymore. No, they are giving, but maybe I just don't want the money. I don't have anything to say. I feel tapped out. Well, get away from there. It's a snake pit. It's a hall of mirrors for narcissists. Get a long way away. Oh, I wish. But it's impossible right now. No, come on. It's always like that. That's always part of the problem. Are you offering me a place? Yeah, sure. You could come over here. Come on over. It may not be the White House, but, uh, you know, at least here you're wanted. I'm so glad I came here. Shouldn't have invited him. Incredible. Look, there it is again. The Middle Ages got left behind on this rock. Time just moved on. There he goes again. That's him, all right. Always enthused and always ready with the right words for all occasions, as if uh, everyone was still waiting for his opinion, as if life itself was one giant press conference. Maybe that's all there is to his public persona. Maybe I've been fooling myself these last 20 years, always looking for the real guy behind the facade. Maybe the facade is the real guy. This is amazing. Sure it is. Everything's always amazing to this guy. God, why am I bitching all the time? Maybe it's just a premonition that this trip's gonna be a disaster. I can't say that I need Jack's company this time in my life. I'm residing quite contentedly in my own midlife crises. Thank you very much. This is about as far away from Washington as I could possibly get. Thank you. There he goes. That's why he irritates me, and that's why I love him, too. The states, the whole shebang. Behind the innocents, there may be a calculating politician, but behind the politician, there's an innocent. He's still American enough. He doesn't lie well at all. He means it. You want to stop the car and get out and take a look around? Yeah, you want to do something different? You want to walk over there? Walk across that swamp? Yeah, just like our ancestors did centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries ago. 
You're the one that wanted to do all the walking. Come on, let's go. So are we going to do something today? I thought I'd finish my book. Hmm? But you always have a book to read. I'm bored. Where's Roman? I don't care what Roman is doing. You know, I wanted to do something with you. I shouldn't have come. I should have just done something with Dad. Come on, kid. And you just stay cooped up in this medieval island, just reading your books. You know, you, you're not even aware of what's going on around you. You could be anywhere. It wouldn't even make a difference. You should just go out more, meet some people. Yeah, I will. I'm going. <sighs> Bye. Are you moving to France permanently? What? I thought you couldn't live anywhere but in New York. What about the theater? Did you give that up for good? No, it may have given me up for good. I don't think I'm enough involved in real estate to live in Manhattan. Or any other business, some other hustle, you know? I lived in New York when I was young inside of it. My friends and I were more interested in our work than in our investments. We weren't invidious, we were nurturing. And then, you know, alimony, the IRS, being denied the right to parent my own child, custody, they brought reality in, and hey, who needs it? You know, when Richard Nixon got on that chopper in 1972, I think the fight went out of all of us, didn't it? The big business took over and set the agenda, and. Boy, when you buy into big business, when you buy into that, man, you got to emancipate yourself from your morals or you live a life of squeamishness. Is this our same old argument? I lost my morals, did I? Just automatically by going to work on things and staying inside the system. Well, Jack, you're taking me a little personally. I was talking about myself. I was saying that I got a little squeamish, you know? 
You know, I know a lot of people that work at a lot of crasser jobs than you do, and they're happy, you know. They're, they're happy, they're healthy, they're not depressed, they enjoy the material blessings. Me, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't stand it. I just couldn't. You know, Confucius say of the 39 steps of escape, the best one's flight, so I fled. And here I am in France, where I can pull down my pants. <laughs> I'm enough of a retarded romantic, I guess, to believe that France is still a place where you can get away and think. So I'll stay. I guess. Or I won't. We'll see. This place is like a fairy tale. How did we wind up here? I bet there's some secret plan of yours behind all this. You know, I bet I could say the same thing about you. No, I just thought you might like to come here to, uh, discover that precious quality that the world so desperately lacks. Oh, yeah. Vision. Perspective. Perspective, Jack. This is why the dead are placed in the middle of the town among the houses. Death is a part of life, not separate from it. But you will see there aren't enough graves for all the generations of Mont Saint Michelien, so every decade or so the bones are dug up so new bodies can be buried here. And since they believed you will need your bones again on Judgment Day, they placed them nearby in the charnel house. Oh, that's disgusting. I like cemeteries. And in the back there, in the church, there is a relic of a saint. What's a relic? Oh, maybe a shaving of the saint's fingernail or a scrap of the saint's skin. Tell me, Jack, how do you expect to govern these people, hmm? That's a good question. You know, there was an Italian premier once. This was just before Mussolini. Somebody asked him if it was difficult to govern Italians. He said, difficult to govern Italians? No, not difficult. Only useless. <laughs> <laughs> now, you didn't say that on the 6 o'clock news. No, but I thought it night and day. Maybe that's why I lost. Anyway, did they really think that their bones would keep until Judgment Day? Well, you got to remember that for them, Judgment Day was right around the corner. They expected it almost hourly. Just like us. I wouldn't say so. Judgment Day for us is different. Not exactly. I think Judgment Day for us is an interruption, a violation, a break in our concept of time. The bomb, the big one, you know? Judgment Day for them was kind of the ultimate day off, not the ultimate off day. They didn't have clocks. There wasn't any mechanical time. Time was season to season, dawn to dusk, Sabbath to Saint Day, and everything led towards Judgment Day. Judgment Day was uh, the reason that everybody was alive in the first place. Judgment Day was a day of deliverance. It's kind of like, you know, Sunday when you get the, the times delivered. Time was sacred. They'd ring a bell in the morning, they'd ring a bell in the evening, and those moments would change a little, but uh, basically the rhythm of their era was so different from ours that I don't think that we could even imagine it. I guess we're a little early. No saint stands alone. What? No saint stands alone. Every time I come here, these lines come to me. God knows from where. It sometimes it takes me weeks, even years, to figure out what the hell they mean. Did you ever read any of the books that I sent you? No, I'll tell you, not since you stopped thinking about coming back to help me with my speeches. Did you ever read any of the speeches I sent you? Oh, I tried. I mean, you know, the old attention span is not what it used to be. That's true, mine either. I don't have any attention anymore for anything that's not specific. Poetry just confuses me. Yeah, politics. Politics confuses everybody. Including its practitioners. But I know what no saint stands alone means. Oh, yeah? What? It's the essence of my profession. Because between every politician and his own point of view, there's always three fat cats, two tack lobbyists, half a dozen microphones. No man is an island. Entire of itself, every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee.
Can't you just feel the place watching you? Yeah, it makes you feel pretty small. Yeah, I was supposed to. The individual in the human body was supposed to feel small, dwarfed, denied all independent existence. We lost some of the sense of being all one. But we got our freedom. That's not a bad trade-off, really. I don't know. Still don't know if it's worth it. If we haven't lost more than we've gained, all I ever hear anybody talk about today is themselves. I wrote a poem once. It's uh, titled, The Stones Speak, I Am Silent. Well, at least you're free to think what you want and do what you can about it. Think of the poor guy who had to carry the stones up the hill to build this place. He didn't have any say in his life at all. Or try running for office someday. You won't feel so bad. Someone else sets the agenda. Someone else sets the schedule. Somebody else decides what you can say and what you better not say. Talk about losing yourself. People have been known to forget their own names. Maybe you're too smart to be president. Yeah, a television correspondent told me that once. What'd you say? I got a little steamed. I said American voters want their leaders to be dumber than they are. They figure they'll do less harm that way, and that it's an expensive form of cynicism. You said that on TV? Yep. You're not so smart after all. You go through here. It's up here. After you. functioning for hundreds, hundreds of years, since before the beginning of modern times. Yeah, but this is different from the kind of time you were talking about before, sunrise to sunset, Sabbath to Sabbath, isn't it? This is, uh, this is mechanical time, isn't it? You bet, you bet it is, you bet. I sometimes think that this clock, this machine, is what constitutes humanity's first real break from the world of nature. Wouldn't you say so? Hello? The clock did much more than that. It became the model of the cosmos. And then they mistook the model for the real thing. People got the idea that nature was just a giant clock, not a living organism, but a machine. That's exactly what I've been trying to tell this lunkhead, exactly, word for word. Maybe you recognize him. Jack Edwards, and you're? Uh, Sonia Hoffman. I think I've heard your name somewhere. Yeah, maybe in a couple of hundred news broadcasts. He was a candidate for the U.S. presidency in the primaries. Oh, I vaguely remember. See, I'm not a voter. Most Americans don't vote either. I do know who you are. Me? You know who I am? I doubt it. I... You're Thomas Harriman, the poet. Well, yes, I am, but uh, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You recognize me, a poet whose latest work sold all of 12,000 copies, but you do not recognize this gentleman who uh, was a presidential candidate in America? My God, woman, what's happened to your values? What do you do? I'm a scientist, and we do occasionally read poetry. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a lot of it these days. I'm on a sort of sabbatical. I'm an ex-physicist. An ex-American resident, an ex-voter. Ex-wife? This is very upsetting. Why don't intelligent people like yourself bother to vote? Well, forgive me, you politicians make it so hard. Uh, the ideas expressed by most of you, right and left, seem to me as antique and mechanical as that old clock. What's that supposed to mean? Well, if I was to explain that, I'd have to go all the way back to... Descartes, if you remember him. Yeah. To be or not to be? I think, therefore, I am. Yeah, well, we both went to college, yeah. Well, Descartes was the primary architect of the view that sees the world as a clock. A mechanistic view that still dominates most of the world today, and it seems to me, especially you politicians. Mechanistic? Is that a real word? Mechanistic? Mechanical? Mechanics? Yeah, it's a good word. 
mechanistic, as if nature functioned like a clock. You take it apart, reduce it to a number of small, simple pieces, easy to understand, analyze them, put them all back together again, and then you understand the whole. Isn't that what's known as scientific thinking, Miss Hoffman? Really, what you call the mechanistic view, isn't that what the scientific method's all about? Is it? Well, I don't think so, but I'd like to kind of hear from the physicist, Jack. All right, I'm sorry. Please continue. Well, you're right in a way, Mr. Um... Jack. Call me Jack. <laughs> okay, Jack. You are right in a sense. But it wasn't always so. Not before Descartes. When he introduced such thinking, it amounted to a revolutionary break with the church. He said, I don't need the Pope to tell me how the world functions. I can find that out for myself. Because to me, the world is just a machine. And then he became fascinated with clockworks and made the clock into a central metaphor. He said, I consider the human body as nothing but a machine. A healthy man is like a well-made clock. A sick man is like an ill-made clock. Well, the metaphor seems a little clumsy now, but it worked, didn't it? <laughs> yes, so successfully that scientists came to believe that all living things, plants, animals, us, are nothing but machines. And that's the fallacy. It carried over into everything, arts, politics. I don't know, it seems to me that most people don't even remember who Descartes was. I'm sorry, I guess I just don't follow you. But he'd like to. If you could just break it down into 30 second media bites, that's more what he's used to. Very funny. All right, what is it that I don't recognize? What's so bad about Descartes? But there's nothing bad about Descartes. In fact, I think Descartes is wonderful. He was a godsend to the 17th century. But times have changed since then. We need a new way of understanding life. That pendulum, for example, has long since been replaced by a tiny quartz crystal. And these magnificent hand-forged wheels <laughs> turned into a microchip the, the size of my thumbnail. That's how far modern science has left mechanistic thinking behind. But you politicians, you seem to have that clockwork still ticking in your head. Keep on going, Sonia. Don't stop. Who knows? You may just have that vital piece of information that we Pauls, venal and stupid as we are, have been missing out on all along. Well, there you go, thinking in terms of pieces. Pieces are all we get of the picture, only fragments. Come on, give me some examples. Well, let's take the population problem, for example. You can't solve it by looking at different forms of birth control in isolation. Research has proven again and again that the most effective form of birth control is not a pill. It's economic and social gains which will reduce the desire for large families. That's true. Do you know that in our world, every day 40,000 children die from malnutrition and preventable diseases? That's every other second. It's now. Now. And now, for the short lives of these children cannot be seen in isolation. They're part of a whole system involving the economics, involving the environment, and more specifically, involving high levels of third world debt. How's that? The burden of frenzied borrowing is not falling on those with foreign bank accounts, nor on those who created the imbalance. The burden is falling on the already deprived. Three years ago, President Nairere asked the question, must we starve our children to pay our debts? That question has been answered in practice. And the answer has been yes, because since he asked, hundreds and thousands of little children in the third world have given their lives to pay their country's debts. And millions more are still paying interest with their malnourished minds and bodies. Oh. 
Brazil. Do you know that they are destroying the Amazon rainforest at the rate of one football field a second? Now, now, now. Why? They're trying to pay their national debts with cattle and land speculation. They don't even have time to sell the timber, so they're setting fire to the woods. And our barren forests are one of the main causes of the global warming, the greenhouse effect. And in the meantime, we are pouring our money into the arms race. See, you cannot look at one single of our global problems in isolation, trying to understand it and solve it. Of course, you can fix a fragment of a piece, but it will deteriorate a second later because what it was connected to has been ignored. We have to change everything together at the same time. The ideals, the institutions, the values. All of this sounds kind of familiar. Do you two know each other? Is this a setup? Well, all right. What do I think? Yes, the problems are complex, but you're just looking at the dark side because so is our capacity to respond, isn't it? Communications, data banks, technology. We already have the tools to deal with a lot of these problems, even if they are more complex. Candide himself, the eternal optimist. But don't you see that, that all these new technologies, they're causing more problems than they solve? In medicine, for example, there's been an overwhelming increase in technology, but the costs have spiraled concurrently. It's become medicine for the rich. And public health hasn't improved significantly, although public health would improve dramatically if we just changed our eating habits, for example. But instead, the experts are occupied with making artificial hearts. But if our agribusiness had fed us better instead of chopping down the rainforests in order to make cattle ranches, in order to produce more and more red meat, which is one of the direct causes of heart attacks, then maybe we wouldn't have to spend so much of our money on artificial hearts, and so on and so on. Well, this is all examples of interconnectedness. But, Sonia... All right, supposing that you're right and everything is connected to everything else, as you say. Still, you've got to start somewhere, don't you? So that's the real political question here. Where do you start? By changing the way we're seeing the world. You see, you're still searching for the, for the right piece to fix first. You don't see that all the problems simply are fragments of one single crisis, a crisis of perception. Oh, good. The world is coming to an end, and you say it's a crisis of perception. I'm sorry, that's a little abstract for me. And all of this stuff about modern medicine, all your criticisms. I mean, I may be a doctor's son, but you have to admit that this mechanistic medicine has been pretty successful. Well, up to a point. But simply by blocking the mechanisms of a disease doesn't mean healing it. I mean, it's like in politics. It's just shifting the problem to another sphere. Are you going to help me in this, or are you going to leave me stranded out here in this argument by myself? I'm going to leave you stranded. I'm going to leave you stranded. Okay. A person goes to a doctor today with recurring attacks of gallstones, and the doctor takes the gallbladder out, and lo and behold, the pain goes away. Now, you could say that the doctor is working from a poor perceptual model, that he just concentrated on a part of the clock that wasn't working and removed it. But the fact is, the patient is out of his pain, he's feeling better, and the clock is ticking again. His perceptual model worked. But is everything that works good for the system? Oh, come on, Sonia, that's disingenuous and not at all useful when applied to politics, which is, after all, a system that is based on people. It's the art of bringing people to agree on a certain course of action. If that course of action succeeds, the people are satisfied. If not, they're not. It's as simple as that. If it works, it's good, period. But isn't that exactly what you said, why politics doesn't work anymore? That politics, you said, needed to become the art of the impossible? Whose side are you on? Hers, obviously. She's intelligent, gracious, and she's more attractive. Listen, Jack, I'd like to get back to the systems. You know, you called me dishonest. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I... let's talk about the gallbladder again. Let's say the gallbladder is out, and the pain is gone. But what about the stress that might have brought the illness on? If that stress persists, he's probably gonna get sick again. Or let's say he had changed his nutrition much earlier and done some exercise. 
He may never have developed the Goldstones in the first place. See, a little health education might have been much cheaper than the operation. A lot less painful, too. But our system doesn't encourage prevention. It encourages intervention. Okay, you're not disingenuous, but to blame all this on a French philosopher who's been dead for 300 years, isn't that a little out of proportion? Maybe even a little eccentric? No. Not if I'm right. See, my point isn't to condemn Descartes' thinking. It's simply to recognize its limitations. It might have been extremely useful to perceive the world as a machine for 300 years, but that perception today is not only inaccurate, it's actually harmful. We need a new vision of the world. What's that quotation? It's foolish for a society to try to cling to its old ideas in new times, just as it's foolish for a grown man to try to squeeze into the coat that fit him in his youth. Something like that. Thomas Jefferson. Maybe you're not crazy. I don't know, Sonia. This new vision of the world might just be some sort of millennium madness, some kind of St. Vitus' dance of the mind as we approach the year 2000. No, everybody's aware now. We can make ourselves extinct at the press of a button. And we're soiling every square foot of land, sea, and air. That water looks clean, but it's not, is it? Not really. Nothing is. The English Channel is one of the most polluted bodies of water in the world. And the oysters around here are famous, aren't they? Soon they won't be safe to eat. Not only that, this water is radioactive, contaminated by a nuclear plant a few miles from here. Yeah, I read about that too. Politicians can read. We know all about these things, and some of us think about them every day. I know I do. But we have to deal with a different set of constraints, different kinds of interdependence than the ones you're talking about. If, let's say it turns out to be true. But what you said is true. Cattle are brutally treated, loaded up with chemicals, too much red meat is bad for you, and the landscape's being wrecked by overgrazing. Let's say all that turns out to be true. So for good health and a hundred other reasons, I help enact a tax on the consumption of red meat. The way we tax tobacco to make people think twice about that kind of consumption. What a wonderful idea. We could do cancer and heart research for the revenue. Yes, and I'd have 50 lobbyists pounding on my door while a hundred different meat producers, political action committees, poured money into my opponent's campaign, and my switchboard was lit up all day long with calls from senators and representatives and governors of all the meat-producing states. But okay, Sonia, just for you, let's say that I take all that on. As Sam Rayburn said, every once in a while, a man ought to do something just because it's right. But if, on top of that, I come out against a few weapons programs and try to do something about acid rain and sponsor a bill supporting increased funding for solar energy, you know what? By the next election, anybody who would run against me, and I mean anybody, would have the combined funds of all those people to defeat me, and he would, too. And I'm not even saying it's wrong. Because when you get that far out in front of public opinion, that's the way they let you know. So I do what everybody else does, from the lowliest congressman right on up to the president of the United States. I pick a few crucial issues that I think are crucial, a part of your whole, and I persist and persist until I get somewhere if I'm lucky. And for the rest, I mark time, I wait, I go along. I, I trade off. This is why I don't vote. Excuse me, it's what we've been talking about. You get people to eat less red meat, and then you do something like paying off the farmers, buying up surplus butter and subsidizing its price. So if we don't get a heart attack one way, you'll just find another way to give it to us. Well, I agree with you. We wouldn't contradict each other, or we wouldn't contradict ourselves so much if we didn't do things piecemeal. But, you know, there's something a little scary, maybe something even a little cruel about your theoretical exigency here. I mean, are you going to be the one who tells everyone what's good for them? Are you going to tell a farmer that there's something wrong with the goals that he and his family have pursued for generations and then, what, just shut them down? You know, maybe we are beaten up all day long by private interests, but at least our government is now stays close to what people perceive to be their needs. Look, the world changes faster than people's perception of it. Wouldn't it be a challenge for a great political leader to bridge the gap, to inform? 
to allow us to feel responsibility. Anyway, the people don't trust you politicians anymore. At your last election, only 50% of them even bothered to vote. Yeah, getting them back would really require a politics of the impossible. What a great campaign slogan. Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> I'd vote for it. Oh, good. I get the poet vote. Ah, politics of the impossible. Yeah, you might get my vote, too. Oh, great. Add to that the support of all well-informed but non-participating women living on medieval islands. There's no victory. Why does that make me angry? Oh, probably because they don't want to have anything to do with us. They don't believe in us. There isn't really any reason why they should, Jack, except their own eventual aging. Nah, I don't even notice where they are. They think this is the movies, but this room is absolutely contemporary. Everybody's got a torture chamber now. I don't even notice. Are you going to say this is part of your crisis of perception, too? Yeah, or maybe we're all led a little towards death, like wolves to the weak. Or maybe people are just shits. Hmm? You'd like to blame this on Descartes. I'd like to blame it on anybody. But this is such a part of human history. Well, I don't know about Descartes, but I do know that Francis Bacon presided over the witch trials of King James I at a time when millions of women were tortured or burned for practicing folk medicine or worshipping pre-Christian goddesses or simply because they were unusual. I would probably have ended up on the stake myself. See, I don't believe it was a metaphor when Francis Bacon wrote that nature had to be hounded in her wanderings, bound into service, made a slave. He even said that scientists, with their new mechanical devices, had to torture nature's secrets out of her. Did you notice how he uses her when describing Mother Nature? Hmm? As if nature was nothing but a witch. Yes. It's actually fair to say that this room represents a crisis of perception. But this room was here for a long time before Descartes and Bacon. Violence goes on no matter how mankind understands the world, doesn't it? And exploitation. Of course, we'd all like to think it would be different if we saw things differently. But hasn't modern science, technology, business done exactly what Francis Bacon preached? Tortured our planet. Didn't we just implement the old patriarchal idea about man dominating all? I don't know, Sonia. Let me be the devil's advocate here for a minute. How much have we really tortured and handed the planet? I mean, you could say not much compared to what the Ice Ages did to the world, for example. And who says that nature can't cope? We're all scared to death about the disappearing ozone layer, but we only started studying ozone levels about 10 years ago. It could be that this, these so-called holes in the atmosphere have been appearing and then disappearing again since the beginning of time. Couldn't it? Could be that nature has a healing mechanism that we don't even know about. It could be that this hysteria about ultraviolet rays is nothing more than that, just hysteria. That's exactly what he said about the German forests only a few years ago. And look at them now. More than half of the trees in the Black Forest are dying. We can't explain it away any longer. We simply cannot take the risk. Right here around this island, the tides are slowing down. Maybe because of silt building up from garbage being dumped in the bay or from the overuse of fertilizers. Lakes can die. Entire oceans become polluted. Topsoil, forests, water, poisoned, dead. Things can change so fast. In the hands of man, nature becomes fragile. Rain becomes acid. I agree with everything you said, but why this patriarchal fixation, hmm? 
I mean, in Salem, those women witches were betrayed by other women. Phyllis Schlafly, a woman, has written that God's greatest gift to mankind is the atom bomb. I mean, these are women. Why can't you just say what's patriarchal is what's evil in both men and women and let it go at that? There's plenty of that to go around. Unless, of course, you happen to believe that these women were brainwashed by men like Patty Hearst. Why are you so scornful? Look, there are two great principles functioning in this entire living world. The male principle, pick the adjective, the aggressive, dominating, whatever. And the female principle, nurturing, caretaking, gentle, whatever. What I am saying is that these two principles may have been in a rough balance. But now the men, and yes, I do think it is the men, have created the tools, the weapons, both intellectually and physically, to bring these two principles way out of balance. We have been placing mechanistic tools in the hands of power-oriented, patriarchal people. I'm saying you men are out of control now. And I, you, we all, we, we are the victims. So what's the risk? What's wrong with giving the female principle an opportunity? And I say, let's get out of this room. It's having a torturous effect on our relationship. Look, Sonia, I'm sorry if I ruffled your feathers down there. I just, um, you know, I'm, I'm a failed husband, so I'm a little too sensitive about all that stuff. I'm also a starving poet and a bad teacher. And Jack here is another midlife casualty, except that his wife is still around. I don't know, maybe there's a connection in there somewhere for you. What do you do? I mean, what brings you to this far out and remote place? Well, let's see. Um... I'm a scientist, still, even though I'm on a semi-permanent sabbatical. How come? I got tired of seeing my work fed to the U.S. Defense Department. I'm a physicist, the only woman in my graduate department, the first in Norway doing quantum field theory. My uh, speciality was lasers. That time, the challenge was to design lasers of ever shorter wavelengths. The shorter the wavelength, the more powerful, the laser. Our ultimate goal was to create an X-ray laser. And one day, um, I hit upon an unusual idea, which, as it turned out, led to a major advance in that X-ray laser. Well, when you do something like that, science treats you very well. I got many attractive offers, first from Paris and then from the States, and I took them, finally working quite happily in Boston. Until one day, I discovered totally unexpectedly that my work was being perverted. See, I had always looked at the medical applications of my work, of using this laser to uh, provide holographic images of cells or even molecules. It could have helped us solve so many puzzles, even the formation of cancer cells. But what really happened was that a more sophisticated version of my idea was being used in the Star Wars program. And it blew my mind. It, it, it made me reevaluate my whole profession. Anyway, to, to cut it short, in the midst of other events, I just got up and left. What were the other events, if I may ask? experience is not all that different from yours, I suppose. I left Boston, and eventually I came here. I just came one day from uh, Paris, and the place took hold of me. I kept coming back. Well, there were weeks here when the storms chased the tourists away, and, and I had this place all to myself. I started to look at how my special knowledge of subatomic physics relates to the way I perceive the world at large. And I don't know, but I think that I have something to say after my time here. I don't know yet if it will fit into a coherent whole, but this is what I think about when I take my morning walks, which today, for some reason, brought me to you two. See, every morning I, I walk across the island, regardless of the weather, trying to understand its other language. The stones speak, and I am silent. 
Something like that, yes. That's from a poem, isn't it? Well, maybe, I don't know, you know. Uh, do you ever write down any of your thoughts? Oh, yes, all the time. I'd like to combine my notes into a book and call it ecological thinking, as opposed to Cartesian thinking. Cartesian? Yeah, Descartes wrote in Latin. His Latin name was Cartesius, hence Cartesian. Really? I thought it meant map-like, like a map. <laughs> no, you didn't. You thought it meant like a la carte. Yes, like a menu. <laughs> then his name would have been Menusian. I'd like to offer this ecological way of thinking as a new way of looking at things. Help us overcome this crisis of perception. See, what I found here is that to think in an ecological way simply makes more sense of everything. It gives me a much firmer grasp of reality. It gives me strength. Knowledge is power. Yes, but in the sense of personal empowerment, not that old male urge for power over others. Descartes' evil empire again. Descartes had a dream. It was really Isaac Newton who made that dream come true, who transformed it into scientific theory, into power. May God us keep from single vision in Newton's sleep, William Blake. I'm very impressed. No, you two would have a lot in common. You'd have a lot to talk about. He was writing in poetry 200 years ago, what you're saying today in prose. He hated Newton. He hated the concept of single vision. He dedicated his entire life to making art that denied single vision. Of course, of course, the people of his time thought he was a crank. Hmm. Whereas they revered Newton almost as a god by reducing all physical phenomena to the motion of material particles, the motion caused by the force of gravity, he was able to describe the exact effect of gravity on any object with precise mathematical equations. We call it Newton's laws of motion. Really the great achievement of 17th century science. You mean all that stuff that I slept through in high school, like any good poet, all that square root of the hypotenuse divided by a pinch of magnesium, all that stuff? Well, in the right hands, or should I say, aroused minds, these equations seem to work beautifully. I could use Newton's equations to calculate and explain every motion of that throw, from the ballistic curve to the ripples in the water. See, this was a feat so impressive for the time that Newton's mathematical system immediately established itself as the correct theory of reality, the ultimate laws of nature. Descartes' dream of the world as a perfect machine was now an established fact. It brought with it such... Uh, wealth of benefits for people. People could do things they'd never been able to do before. It was irresistible. And of course, the old notions of the world as a living organism was swept away. So what's wrong with Newton? Kit. Well, this is my daughter Kit and her friend Roman. Kit, this is uh, Thomas Harriman. How do you uh, do? And this is Jack... Um... Jack Edwards. Yeah, Jack Edwards. Nice to Hi. Meet you. Hi. What do you think of this new ecological view of your mother's? That's okay. Yeah. Kate is utterly bored hearing me talk about it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're gonna uh, go. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting yes, you. Yes, nice meeting you. See you later. Have fun. See you later. Oh, so she's living here with you? No, she's in her first year in college. She's on a break. But right now, yes, I think she's utterly bored living here with me. I understand that. I have two of my own. Yeah, I had, I mean, I have uh, one. You know, it's no accident that Turner painted light when he did, or that light became the inspiration of the Impressionists. The nature of light became an obsession with the physicists, too. See, none of them could visualize how the light of the sun reached the earth. Why? What is the nature of light? To understand the nature of light, you have to know what matter is made of. I thought it was made of atoms. What's an atom? Well, Newton thought it was small, solid particles. 
but that's not what scientists saw when they observed atoms for the first time. What they saw was totally unexpected and, and shocking. You mean when they discovered that atoms were made up of even smaller particles, a nucleus with uh, electrons whirling around it? Not only that, they were moving in relatively vast regions of empty space. That's what shocked the scientists up. Atoms consist mainly of empty space. What does that mean, vast regions of empty space? Atoms are tiny. Yes, they are. This is what's so hard to visualize. See, the size of atoms is so far removed from our ordinary sense of scale and proportion that it's extremely hard to get a feeling for the relative sizes and distances of their particles. Ask yourself, how many atoms are there in an orange? Now, to answer this, you'll have to blow up the orange to a size where you can actually see the atoms. You'll have to blow up the orange until it's reached the size of the Earth. The atoms inside of it will then be the size of cherries. Myriads of cherries tightly packed into an orange the size of the Earth. Wow, what an image. Oh, I'm serious. I was trying to shrink the Earth orange back down into the size of an orange and imagine all those cherries whizzing around inside of it. It made me dizzy. This is a dangerous height to be dizzy at. But okay, you say that the, the atom is the size of a cherry and that uh, in that cherry atom there's all this empty space. Well, what about the nucleus? There is a nucleus in there, right? I mean, how big is that? That's where we're going here, isn't it? Invisible is the answer. If we blow up the atom to the size of a football, the nucleus would still be invisible. If we blow up the atom to the size of a, a sphere that would fit into this room here, the nucleus would still be invisible. What if you blow it up to the size of this island? to the size of the rock we're standing on. OK. We would blow the atom, the cherry, up to the size of this island. OK, then the nucleus would be the size of a small pebble, something like that. And the electrons would be much smaller still. We would have to look for them all the way down there at the edge of the island. And the whole space in between would be empty. Wow, that's fantastic. It's weird to seem weird in poetry. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that if there were a sphere large enough to contain this whole island, what it would actually consist of is a pebble and a few grains of sand. That's all this huge sphere contains. In other words, nothing. It's empty. But if this rock is made up of spheres like that, then then what makes it so solid? Why can't I pass my hand through it? Why don't we fall through it? Yeah, why don't we fall through everything? Why doesn't everything fall through everything? Well, you see, this is the obvious question that physicists had to ask. Now, remember that all the Newtonian concepts were based on things that could actually be seen, or at least visualized. But what they were now finding in this strange and unexpected world were concepts that could no longer be visualized. And when they went on battling with these absurd phenomena of atomic physics, they were forced to admit to themselves that they didn't have a language, not even an adequate way of thinking to describe their new discoveries. They were forced to think in entirely new ways in terms of radically new concepts. To understand why matter is so solid, they had to question the conventional ideas about the very existence of matter. And after many frustrating years, they were forced to admit that matter does not exist with certainty in definite places, but rather shows tendencies to exist. Tendency? What the hell does that mean? Now, let's say we want to observe an electron out there. Now, we cannot say that it is in a definite place. We can rather say it has a tendency to be out there in the front rather than in the back, or here to the left rather than over there to the right. 
in scientific language, we actually don't speak about tendencies. We speak about probabilities. I seem to remember voting for a bill in the Senate that gave some physicists a lot of money for a detector that they said would tell them exactly where an electron is. Were we being gypped? Not at all. The strange thing is that when you actually make a measurement of the electron, it is in a definite place. But between measurements, you cannot say that it is in a definite place or that it has traveled a definite path from one place to another. You mean when you want to measure it, it just sort of shows up? Yeah. Oh, kind of like out of work actors or presidential candidates like Jack Edwards. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> hey. Hey. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let me get this straight. You measure it and the electron is there. It shows up, like Thomas said. But in between measurements, you can't say for sure that it's in a definite place. Or even that it went on a definite path from one place to another. So how does it go from here to there? It moves, doesn't it? No. You mean it stays in the same place? No. Well, wait a minute. Either the electron moves or it doesn't move. Well, you can't say that. Well, are, are you getting a feeling now of what these physicists felt? You see, an electron doesn't move from place to place, and it doesn't stay in one place either. It manifests itself as probability patterns spread out in space. And the shape of these probability patterns changes with time, something which might seem like movement to human perception. Are you saying that the electron sort of gets smeared out over a uh, large region, and then when you measure it with the measuring gun, it collapses into a small point? You got it. You see, all subatomic particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, manifest this strange existence between potentiality and reality. So at the subatomic level, there are no solid objects. No, they are not. Well, uh, if there are no solid objects at the subatomic level, how are there solid objects at any level? That's the amazing thing. This simple question, what makes this rock so solid, goes way beyond our power of imagination. I mean, I cannot explain this to you in visual terms. Of course, I can do it in mathematical equations, but there's no metaphor for it. How can you live in a world that's unmetaphorical? I mean, uh, you have to perceive reality in some way. I mean, this is solid. Okay. Let's take an atom from within this granite, a silicon atom with its 14 electrons. Now, the probability patterns of these electrons arrange themselves like shells around the nucleus, each shell containing several electrons. Now, within the shells, the electrons are everywhere at the same time, so to speak. But the probability patterns that resemble shells are extremely stable and very hard to compress. Matter is solid because probability patterns are difficult to compress. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> so I was right to sleep through Mr. Giddis's physics class. That little model he made out of Tinker Toys with sticks and balls, that was wrong, right? Right, wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's a lousy visualization, but then no one did it any better. Mm. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is infinite. William Blake. So, Sonia, life's a bunch of probability patterns running around. Probability patterns of what? 
of interconnections. What? <laughs> well, what I'm trying to say is that these probabilities are not probabilities of things, but probabilities of interconnections. See, Jack, that's what she was trying to tell you. <laughs> See, we tend to think of subatomic particles as some kind of small billiard balls or small grains of sand. But for physicists, a particle has no independent existence. A particle is essentially a set of relations that reach outward to connect with other things. What are those other things, please? They are interconnections of yet other things, which also turn out to be interconnections, and so on and so on. You see, in atomic physics, we never end up with any things at all. The essential nature of matter lies not in objects, but in interconnections. Ah! Everybody knows the chord. It's a third, the most basic of harmonies. Carries with it a very distinctive feeling, no? And yet, its individual notes carry none of that feeling. Therefore, the essence of the chord lies in its... Lies in relationships. And the relationship between time and pitch... Makes melody. Makes melody. Relationships make music. Relationships make matter. Music of the spheres. As Kepler said. And Shakespeare before him. And Pythagoras before him. Now, this vision of a universe arranged in harmonies of sounds and relations is no new discovery. Today, physicists are simply proving that what we call an object, an atom, a molecule, a particle, is only an approximation, a metaphor. At the subatomic level, it dissolves into a series of interconnections, like chords of music. It's beautiful. Yeah, but there are boundaries, aren't there? I mean, between you and me, for instance. We are two separate bodies, aren't we? That's not an illusion. Is it? Are you saying that there is actually a physical connection between you and me and, and between you and the wall behind you and the air and this bench? Yes. At the subatomic level, there is a continual exchange of matter and energy between my hand and this wood, between the wood and the air, and even between you and me. I mean a real exchange of photons and electrons. Ultimately, whether we like it or not, we're all part of one inseparable web of relationships. How does all this explain light? Yes, finally. Light. Now, light doesn't need a medium, because although it travels in waves, it also travels as particles. Light is both particles and waves? Yes. But the particles of light, which we call photons, are of a very special kind. Unlike other particles, they never stand still. They never speed up, they never slow down. They always travel at the same speed, the speed of light. And the waves are not ordinary waves, like water waves. They are abstract patterns of probabilities, traveling in the form of waves. Patterns of relationships like everything else. Exactly. I get it. Well, I don't get it, but I, I get it. Let there be light. And like light, a great variety of other high-energy particles, cosmic rays, bombard the Earth. 
all these particles colliding with the air, creating more particles, interacting further, creating and destroying more particles. And we are in the middle of this cosmic dance of creation and destruction, all of us, all the time. Shiva Nataraj. I beg your pardon? Shiva Nataraj, the uh, Hindu god of dance. The Hindus believe that Shiva's dance sustains the universe, that, that uh, Shiva's dance is the universe. The ceaseless flow of energy going through a multiplicity of patterns, dissolving into one another. That's physics. No, that's poetry. <laughs> that's wonderful. No, really, that's great. But I hope this doesn't bother anybody. What do you do with it? What's it for? Well, you don't do anything with it, I don't think. You just think about it, contemplate it. Are you guys hungry? I'm hungry. Let's go get something to eat. How can they do that here? I mean, how can they do that anyway? It's your fault. What? Well, okay, it's not your fault. It's physicists' fault. They made the bomb. <laughs> you can't blame littering on the bomb. Why not? The bomb made the whole planet disposable. Littering is an expression of uh, powerlessness. Like, hey, what difference does a little more crap make? It's all going anyway, completely, you know? Maybe you're right. You know, I visited Hiroshima ten years ago. I went to the museums. I saw the photographs of devastation. I went to the Peace Park, looked at all the monuments, a statue of a mother with a baby, a statue of a goddess enveloped in paper cranes, big peace bell. And then I saw a mound about six feet high, covered with grass. It wasn't decorated in any way. It wasn't a symbol of anything. No monument. It simply contained the ashes of the atomic bomb victims. The actual remains of what was left of tens, maybe hundreds and thousands of men and women and children incinerated because of our knowledge. A flash of light that burned them and obliterated them and totally transformed the world. And as I stood in front of that mound of ashes, I um, felt that I was face to face with the victims of while. I can't say the victims of my work as a scientist, as a physicist. I cried. When I was little up on the third floor with my brother, we'd lie in our beds watching the heat lightning flashes and he'd say, what's that? And I'd say, uh, that's it, that's the big one, we're all gonna die. You can't make yourself responsible for Hiroshima, Sonia, just because you do physics. You didn't invent the bomb, and even if you had, somebody else decided to use it, a politician. Oppenheimer said he felt he had blood on his hands, and he did invent it, but President Truman's answer was, who the hell does he think he is? I'm the one who ordered them to drop the damn thing. Even Oppenheimer wasn't to blame. Scientists are supposed to figure things out. It's up to the rest of us to figure out what to do about it. I'm sorry, Sonia. I was only kidding. Maybe uh, littering is more an expression of poor toilet training. Hmm? Like, I don't know. Maybe we could change the subject. There is no accountability for scientists as there is for other professions. Why aren't we obliged, like medical doctors, to not use our knowledge destructively? It's not that simple, I don't think. Oppenheimer said he had blood on his hands. He had regrets after the fact. I have regrets because of my X-ray laser. 
See, I'm responsible for the consequences of my discovery. You know, we never talked about responsibility at the university, not in my time. We never discussed ethics. We were never taught value thinking. No one induced upon us the wisdom of the American Indian tribes who made all their important decisions with the seventh generation in mind. We were never taught to think about the future that way. We were taught in our closed rooms that we were doing pure science in the pursuit of pure truth, the noble pursuit of pure truth. Well, that's what science is, Sonia. Don't be so hard on yourself. No, that's what science was, maybe. But pure science hardly exists today. The scientist isn't sitting in his lab anymore, choosing to work on what fascinates him most. Science is expensive. And the Pentagon, who pays most of it, decides what is fascinating. 70% of all science done in the United States today is paid by the military. We give our knowledge away without thinking about the values, without thinking about who is responsible. Well, but there is oversight. I've served on some of those oversight committees. Scientism is an irrational belief in the truth of science. It's become a religion today. It's not a good religion, but it is a dominating religion. And people, of course, who see what miracles physicists are able to achieve, like going to outer space or splitting atoms or making bombs, believe that scientists who are so powerful also must be very wise. And so they don't question their work anymore. And they leave their own responsibility in the hands of these people they envision to have this power of knowledge. And although they know that scientists are doing scary things in the shadows, they just hope that they will be careful. And then scientists hand over their responsibility to those who are paying them. And I know what happens when you hand over your responsibility to those who pay you, like I did with my laser. It broke my heart. If you're worried about the possible dangers of genetic engineering, who do you go to for advice? You have to ask a scientist. He's the only one who understands. And you pretty much have to take his word for it, too, because often you don't know even what questions to ask. Science should welcome your questions, because science itself should question everything. You know, these oversight committees hold hearings from time to time, where the public is invited to comment. Maybe you should be there. A person like you might be able to do some good. He's still running. Only the Terminator can stop him. Should we get the check? I'll pay. Oh, no, 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 no. Nineteen sixty-eight, Chicago, Democratic Convention. The cops are getting ready to charge the demonstrator, and I'm standing there next to this guy who I have never before seen in my life, and I say to him, well, I'm going home. And he says, don't go home, go into politics. And like a fool, I listened to him. That guy was Jack, who is today a uh, conservative Democrat, whatever the hell that is. I was working for a delegate. I, I wasn't even a demonstrator. I was just trying to get into the hall. Then the cops charged the crowd. We all got tear gassed. I broke my nose. We all spent the night in Mayor Daly's jail. <sighs> Whatever happened to all those people? Jesse Jackson got most of them. And the rest of them went to sleep. I don't mean politically, Jack. And primaries are over, okay? I mean personally. I mean, whatever happened to them? Where do they go? Where do they live? What do they do? Well, I don't know personally, but politically, the Green Party got them, at least in Europe. The peace activists, the environmentalists, the feminists, the old student left. Peace. The Green Party got them all. But what happened to them, really? I think it proves that ecological thinking is getting stronger and stronger. People who see the whole picture, who see that all these questions are related to each other. She's back. Uh, Gorbachev? Gorbachev? Is he at the Chicago demonstration? <laughs> hmm. 
Mom, I thought you were with those men. Oh, yeah, they're out there. Yeah. We're going to the beach. I'm changing my shoes. What's the trouble? Nothing. Did I do something wrong? No, it's just I can't stand you talking about what's wrong with the world and your new vision of reality when what I hear I and mean, what I think is that you're talking about your own problems or how you yourself feel disconnected. I mean, you can't even relate to me. Are you coming with us this time, kid? Yeah. Come, kid, please. Do you mind if I go? No. Mom, I like Jack. Be, be real with him. Don't pour him to death. Kid, he's a married man. I could do you some good. And in 1968, Richard Nixon won the youth vote. 1980 and 1984, Ronald Reagan did the same thing. Majority of Americans are very conservative. You know, I think we are dealing with a historical process that's so deep that even Americans won't be able to resist it much longer. When I look around in the sciences, I see the same patterns emerging everywhere, the same notions of holism, the same thinking in terms of processes instead of structures. It's happening in America, too, because once something takes hold in the sciences, it will spread. It always has, whether we like it or not. We, oui, I'm glad to hear you say that. I thought you'd given up on America. What's wrong with him? The color has probably caught him. He's a poet. He's got a license to be moody. It's taken him miles from his home, but it's kept him free. So... I sometimes think he can change his thoughts, his point of view about anything, anytime he wants. If he meets someone like you who sees things in a completely new way, he's totally free to go along with it. And should you succeed in really changing his views and win him over, you can be sure he'd sit right down and put those new ideas into a play or a poem. And people would admire him for his flexibility. And you, you feel constrained by your constituency. Hmm? Yeah, kind of. They want me to be the good old conservative Democrat they voted for. And basically, that's what I am. Anyway, I'm supposed to represent them. It's not all up to me. It's supposed to be the will of the people that sets the course. And the government that finds the means, the best way to give the folks what they want. Of course, it's all a mess right now. The problems are so complex. There's so much crossover from one problem to another. It's hard for people to even begin to think about them. But still, I think Thomas Jefferson was every bit as great a mind as Isaac Newton was. I doubt if there's been a better form of government anywhere in history ever. And of course, getting into politics is nothing to be ashamed of. To me, it's still the biggest challenge there is. But things are changing faster and faster every day. A few years back, the greenhouse effect was just a theory and now we're just not keeping up. But, Sonia, the question is, can your ideas change that? Hasn't a lot of what we've been talking about been discussed and recognized already and, and all, recognized in all the environmental legislation? Clean water in 72, clean air in 77, 12, 14 years ago, and we're still falling behind. So can your ideas make these things move faster? I mean, 
if you're going to wait for most of the people to be ready to go along with you before you move, which is what you have to do. I'm sure you're not a secret lover of dictatorships, but wouldn't it take some kind of totalitarian regime to put ideas as comprehensive as yours into effect? So how does all this tra translate into politics, or doesn't it? Is this just going to be the best conversation I've had in months, or is there still a chance you can get me elected president? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> Jack, are you still asking me for program? I'm trying to make you embrace a vision. But you just want to know what the packaging is. I'm a practical man. I'm from Missouri. I thought you were from the East Coast. That's an expression. It means show me. Devising policies, that's your job. I do think that as long as you continue looking at things through that old patriarchal Cartesian Atonian lens, you're going to miss out on what the world really is. You, we, all of us, we, we need a new vision of the world and we need a more comprehensive, more inclusive science to support us. There is a new theory emerging now, which places all the ecological concepts we've been talking about into one coherent scientific framework. We call it systems theory. The theory of living systems. Living systems? Mm-hmm. All living organisms, as well as social systems and ecosystems. See, this theory would help us get a much firmer grasp on the sciences that deal with life. Are these all your own ideas, or do other people share them? I, I mean, has this been applied in the sciences anywhere? Am I a crank? <laughs> it's okay, Senator. This is real science. And many scientists, including some Nobel laureates, have been working on these ideas. Prigozhin. Bateson, Maturana, just to mention a few. Yes, it is science, but of a new kind. Instead of concentrating on basic building blocks, the systems view concentrates on principles of organization. Instead of cutting things to pieces, it looks at the living system as a whole. How can you think usefully about things in this holistic way? That's what I don't see. Uh, you can contemplate them, you can look at them, as Thomas says. But if you want to do something, if you want to get into specifics, by definition, don't you have to take things apart? Uh, how can you talk usefully about a tree without talking about its roots or its leaves or its bark? Well, I could, <laughs> without even naming the parts you mentioned. Well, a Cartesian would look at a tree and conceptually take it to pieces. But then he would never really understand the nature of the tree. A systems thinker would look at a tree and see the seasonal exchange between tree and earth, earth and sky. Would see the annual cycle, which really is one big breath the earth takes through its forests, providing us with oxygen. A breath of life, linking the earth with the sky and us with the universe. A systems thinker would look at the tree and see the life of the tree only in relation to the life of the whole forest. Would see the tree as a habitat for birds, a home for insects. But if you look at a tree and and try to understand it as something separate, you will be bewildered by the millions of fruits it's producing in its lifetime. Because only one or two trees will grow from those fruits. Though if you look at the tree and see it as a member of a larger living system, that abundance of fruits will make sense. Because hundreds upon hundreds of Forest animals and birds will survive because of them. Interdependence. And the tree cannot survive on its own either, 
To draw water from the ground, it needs the fungus that grows at the tip of each root. And the fungus needs the root to survive, and the root needs the fungus. If one dies, the other dies. And there are millions of relationships like this in our world, each depending on each other for life. The system's theory recognizes this web of relationships as the essence of all living things. Only the uninformed would call such a notion naive or romantic, because this dependency we all share is a scientific fact. A web of relationships. Yes, but this time it is the web of life itself. The theory of living systems actually provides you with an outline of an answer to that eternal question, what is life? Okay, Sonia, let's hear it. What's life? Well, in system language, the answer would be the essence of life is self-organization. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> what is life, ma'am? Well, life is self-organizing. I mean, it's <laughs> very nice. That's very, 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 very nice. That's very nice, ma'am. That's very, very nice. That's very nice. I don't know, it just sounds to me like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Maybe there's somebody down here that speaks your language. Did you ever watch them? <laughs> well, you know, as Merlin once said to King Arthur, don't dishonor your feast by rejecting what's come to it. Sit. What is life? Life is self-organized. Well, that's just extraordinary. Yes, it is. And it means something specific, too. It means that a living system is self-maintaining, self-renewing, self-transcending. What does self-maintaining mean? Well, it means that a living system, although depending on its environment, is not determined by it. Take the yellow fields of rye around this island. With all the rain here, those fields should be green all year round, but every summer they turn yellow. Why? Well, to use a metaphor, each plant remembers that it originated in the hot and dry climate of southern Asia. It remembers, and not even a dramatically different climate can change its inner workings. Self-maintaining, self-organizing. I see. What about self-renewing? What does that mean? Take us. Like all living organisms, we are constantly replacing ourselves in continuous cycles. Much faster than you can imagine. Your pancreas, for example. Do you know that it replaces most of its cells within 24 hours? That means that you wake up with a new pancreas each morning and a new stomach lining as well. And your skin, do you know that your skin falls off at the rate of, of 100,000 cells a minute? Do you know that, that most of the dust in our homes consists of our own dead skin cells? <laughs> That'll get into a poem. Our households are filled with dead skin. But at the same time, as all these dead cells are being shed, just as many are dividing and producing new skin. That's self-renewing. As Heraclitus once said, a man can't step into the same river twice. Sonia says a man can't shake hands with the same man twice with the same hand, right? Yes and no. Though most of our cells are being replaced, we do recognize each other because, you see, the pattern of our organization is still the same. That's one of the important characteristics of life. Continuous structural change but stability in the pattern of the system's organization. And that's all there is to life? No, there is self-transcending. See, self-organization is not only the living systems maintaining themselves and continuously renewing themselves. It also means that they have an inherent tendency to transcend themselves, to to reach out and, and create new forms. 
See, that is one of the one of the most exciting parts to me that that the basic dynamics of evolution it's not adaptation it's creativity you mean the living systems will evolve just for the hell of it that they'll sort of go exploring whether they need to for survival or not so that i'm not so far out of step as i usually suppose no you're not creativity is a basic element of evolution every living organism has the potential for creativity for Surprising and transcending itself. Creating what, for instance? Beauty? Oh, yes. Beauty, too. See, evolution is so much more than adaptation to the environment. Because what is the environment if not a living system, which evolves and, and creatively adapts itself? So, which adapts to which? Each to the other. They co-evolve. Evolution is an ongoing dance, an ongoing conversation. We are systems and the planet is a system. We don't evolve on the planet. We evolve with the planet. Wouldn't it be extraordinarily powerful if you could introduce just that one idea into the political dialogue? Yeah, Jack, there might be something in this for you to renew your candidacy. Well, as for Sonia and myself. I bet you're going to say that it was my destiny to come here and meet Sonia and listen to these ideas. <laughs> what am I going to do about this? I come from a country where they use 40% of the world's resources to support 6% of the world's population, which makes the population so happy and peaceful that we're the world's biggest drug market. Half our teenagers contemplate suicide, and one in five girls has tried it. Would a systems thinker give nuclear energy a second thought? We're up to our necks in it, in all of its waste. And the most important issue of what you've just been saying is the obsessive pursuit of growth. Now that has to stop. I know, I know. I've been all over this a hundred times. Obsessive growth, pathological growth, destructive growth. But how are you going to get anybody to accept it? What am I going to do? Where do you start? We have to give importance to the next generation. And the next. See, it was only when we failed to include them in our scientific theories and in our pursuit of growth that we placed all living systems in jeopardy. Just contemplate that, that horrifying fact that we are leaving to our children the most poisonous of wastes plutonium it's going to remain poisonous for the next generation and the next and the next in fact it's going to remain poisonous for half a million years we should never have accepted that theory knowledge is power we should never have accepted the idea that what's good for general motors is good for america we need a sustainable society one in which our, our needs are being satisfied without diminishing the, the, the possibilities of the next generation. But you're asking me, you're asking me, what should you do? I don't know what you should do. You know what you should do. I know that what worked for me was to come here, be quiet, and take one thing at a time, think one thought to its end. Now, that was my first real step, telling you was my second. You can't pass the buck that easily. How about doing something direct about this? How about helping me? How about joining my staff? <laughs> what, what do you mean? I don't know. Finding a way to get these ideas of yours into the political mainstream. You say it's urgent. You say the ideas are practical. I'll give you a chance to prove it. Of course, it'll be frustrating work. You'd have to watch a lot of lying and wheeling and dealing. You'd have to learn how to compromise, too. You'd have to get your hands dirty. Well, I get them dirty the way I want, here. In my ivory tower. Where I can sit and think. Something that Jack, with his tenacious pursuit of the common good, uh, not to mention his own career, just doesn't seem to understand how an individual can want to get away. A long, long way away. Thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away. 
so that you can have the luxury of being a voice crying in the wilderness instead of being one of many voices trying to be heard over the clamor knot. Believe me, I, I can appreciate being here. I can understand why that would be nice. I, I see the pedestrian nature of political work, but... Look, if you're going to say no, don't say anything. Just think it over. What time does the tide actually come in? It'll be soon now. It's going to reach its all-year high today. You can go closer. Come. Thomas must like you. He doesn't usually have this much time for other people's ideas, do you? <laughs> well, not yours, maybe. <laughs> no. That's not nice. Yes, I like her. I like you. Yes. A lot of guts. To come here, isolate, stay put, determined to figure things out until you had something to offer, a couple of sods like you and I. You know, a lot of people talk about doing things like that, but how many people actually roll the dice and do it? You could have stayed as long, read as much, and decided that you had absolutely nothing to offer. An isolation in and of itself is a very scary thing, Jack. So, yeah, I like you. I like you, too. It's very brave of you to listen. I'd been disappointed if you hadn't. That would have bothered me, but... But, you know, Jack, I'm not, uh... I'm not so sure that strong-arming her into a Washingtonian office is exactly where she needs to be right now. In fact, it may be exactly where she doesn't need to be. What's eating you? Yeah, you're right. What is this group therapy? All of this is covered in water when the tide comes in, isn't it? Oh, yes. Including the pastures. It must take a special breed of sheep to be able to graze around here at all with all this salt. And how could the grass grow without the manure and the sheep grazing on it? And I wouldn't be surprised if the people around here have a taste for salty lambs, or the people are in it, too. The sea, the grass, the people, the sheep. You ask me what the lobster is weaving down there with its golden feet? I tell you, the ocean knows this. You say, who is the Assidia waiting for in its transparent bell? I tell you, it's waiting for time, like you. You say, who does the macrocystis algae hug in its arms? Study it. Study it at a certain hour in a certain sea, I know. You question me about the wicked tusk of the narwhal, and I respond by describing to you how the sea unicorn, with a harpoon in it, dies. You inquire about the kingfisher's feathers, which tremble in the pure springs of the southern shores. I want to tell you that the ocean knows this, that life in its jewel boxes, as endless as the sand, impossible to count, pure, and the time among the blood-colored grapes has made the petal hard and shiny, filled the jellyfish with light, untied its knot, letting its musical threads fall from a horn of plenty made of infinite mother of pearl. I'm nothing but the empty net which has gone on ahead of human eyes, dead in the darknesses fingers accustomed to the triangle, longitudes on the timid globe of an orange. I walked around like you, investigating the endless star. And in my net during the night, I woke up naked. The only thing caught? A fish. Trapped inside the wind. Pablo Neruda. Pablo Neruda! Does that remind you of anything? Walked around investigating the endless star? Isn't that what you do, Sonia? 
And in my net during the night I awoke naked. Isn't that what you do? Don't you take your net and throw it out into these these far out places of quantum physics and systems theory and and don't you find that the only thing you ever catch is your own self back again? Like a fish trapped inside the wind. Where are the other people in your system, Sonia? The ones you love. What about these tourists here that we feel so superior to? Aren't they too like fish trapped inside the wind and... I don't know, maybe even the feeling's more terrible for them because, you know, they don't have words to describe it. So tell me, Sonia, where are all of us in there? The real people with their qualities, their longings, their weaknesses. Where are you inside there, Sonia? Where's Kit? You know, scientists can tell us what Life's internal metaphors are, whether they're computer chips or clocks. Politicians can tell us what forms our lives should take. But uh, I feel just as reduced being called a system as I do being called a clock. Life's just, just not condensable. You know, one group of people uses one set of words to change the world, then a, another set of people come along with a different set of words to change it, and... I don't mind, you know, it's all the same to me. I don't mind a bit. It's like the season's changing. And I like you. I, I like your timorous courage. I like the fact that you want to make the world a better place. God knows it could use it. And I like my silly friend, Jack, who's crazy enough to think that he wants to be president of the United States. And as for me, <laughs> don't mind me, I'm a fool. But remember, life feels itself. Life feels itself. Differently, perhaps, than all your words for how to manage it. And even with the best intentions in the world, you'll go wrong if you forget that life, 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 life is infinitely more than yours or my obtuse theories about it. Healing the universe is an inside job. And you've helped me. And I love you. And I love you too. I love you both. Water. <laughs> what a day! What a day! to go, we better leave now. Well, why don't you just stay? I don't know. Why don't you just come? Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Don't thank me. I love the day. I hate goodbyes. Maybe it's not goodbye. Please think about what I said. Let us know how the water rises. Does that matter? Of course it matters. Let it get all the way back to the line. Let it renew itself, right, Sonia? Maybe come to Paris to let me know. Or Washington. Or New York.
Where are the other people in your system, Sonia? The ones you love. The real people with their qualities, their longings, their weaknesses. Mom, are you okay? Where are you inside there, Sonia? Where's Kit? Shall we go home? Weekend in France has just come to a close. Maybe I too am tired of being a stranger, of being outside a language and environment which lived, which resonated inside me. Our emotional system, as she might say, needs a larger system to nurture it. Doesn't make any difference. You're locked in with the people you know. You need to belong somewhere. Was right, of course, about damn near everything. Even the parts I didn't understand felt right. So, should I just go with it? Is this one of those turning points? You, the woman, I, the man, this the world. And each is the work of all. There's the muffled step in the sand, the stranger, the crippled, random nun, the dancer, the angels wing over the walkers in the village, and there are many beautiful arms around us and the things we know. I don't know how the rest of the damn poem goes. <laughs> <laughs> 